happy to answer any questions. less 
bloody or tragic, it does turn the scene into something that was probably quite dirty and in no way exalted into something that seems different, something that seems magic. And it exonerates the czar and uh, Tsarina because the devil invoked it. And there's a scene in terms of food. If we see exactly how it was the devil provokes the riot. Just out of a sense of, you know, let's screw things up. <laughs> so she's kind of like a Shin Harrison to Alyosha. Yes, absolutely. Anything else? These photographs you referred to, are they available for research now? And if they are, how do they survive the revolution? Wait, I mean, I'm, even I'm sorry. I spoke of photographs. Oh, well, I think many of them were probably sent off to some other royal families. I mean, you know, there were a lot of people were hemophiliacs in Europe, and that's because all of them intermarried. Uh, the Alexandra carried it from her grandmother, Queen Victoria, who the mutation probably occurred in her somehow since it hadn't been seen before, and many crown princes die across Europe. Not the women, because women are carriers. Uh, and when the guards locked them in the palace and when they uh, shipped them off, you know, a lot of things were stolen, a lot of other things were ripped up with bayonets, but a lot of things were also saved. There's photographs that I, mean, I can't tell you how they made it out or how many of them made it out, but they do exist and are reproduced. I mean, the story is about killing the Borzoi dogs simply because they were associated with the royal family. It seemed like the grass would have been things got away with as well, apparently. Um, I, you know, it was, it, was, it was a slow process that, an inevitable but somewhat slow process that ended in their assassination. Kerensky never intended for it to happen. Uh, they, you know, it happened more than a year after the Tsar's abdication. And as the revolution continued to evolve, other people took over, people who demanded the death of the royal family because it was a necessary symbol. And that, for example, has only recently been, um, I mean, the details of it have only recently been available because uh, it was only after the Soviet Union collapsed that people who had actually seen it went on the records and told graphically exactly what happened. And one of the things that was particularly gruesome about it was that in hopes of, they always hoped to be rescued, and in fact, the White Army did have plans to rescue them. They just were defeated. But to preserve some of the outrageous wealth that they had, all along in captivity, the girls, all the sisters, had been sewing jewels into their underclothes, their corsets. And tragically, uh, when the, they were taken into a basement room, they were told that they were going to be moved again, and then a firing squad came in and shot them. But the jewels provided something of a bulletproof vest, so the girls died rather horribly and slowly and were eventually bayoneted to death. Um, it's, there's a, it's, it's an incredibly rich and sad and fascinating story of a family that wasn't a bad family, just one that was round between the wheels of history, really. Tsar Nicholas was not a bad guy. He wasn't the sharpest blade in the drawer. In fact, Alexandra was much more intelligent, but had no sense of how to deal with the people and was terribly shy. Yeah? Yeah, could you talk a little more about how you did the research for this book other than reading the Massey book many years ago? Did you do all of it by reading and doing research here in the U.S.? Did you travel? I did, actually. Um, I did all the research here. Uh, the fact that the book became somewhat fantastic gave me latitude. But the biggest thing was the first book that I wrote that was set in another time and place, I was very punctilious of went to Spain and did all my homework uh, in the country that it took place in. And 
made only very few changes or additions based on that experience. Some, but not such a huge amount. The second book that I wrote that took place in another time and place was set in Shanghai. And because my grandmother had grown up there and she raised me, I knew anecdotally a lot of what it was like to live in Shanghai in 1900. So I'd written the entire book, but I insisted on going to Shanghai to check myself um, and made no changes. I made a couple of sort of climate adjustments <laughs> uh, in the color of a river or something, but that was pretty much it. So the, the third time was The Seal Life, which was based on actually I mean, inspired by my grandmother, my grandfather's experiences in Alaska in 1917. He, he was born in London, he was a young man with wanderlust and eventually made it as far as Alaska. And he told great stories and he had taken photographs and had seen the photographs. And it was a time in my life where heading off to Anchorage would have been complicated and quite a trial for my family and for me. And I thought, you know, 100 years ago, global warming, and, uh, and the fact that Anchorage had been nothing but a tent city in 1916, 17, and was, had now been replaced by a rather, in cold, yes, but you know, pretty, from what I understand, a not particularly remarkable American city with strip malls and all the rest of it. I thought that there was actually a danger, perhaps, in going there because my understanding <coughs> of what it was like was based on my grandfather's experiences 100 years earlier. So I thought, you know, I'm not going to go. And I made it. A lot of the, it, the book is about a young man who's uh, very lovelorn and his quite bleak inner life when he loses the woman he loves is continuous with the environment, the whole, the, all of it. And because he has been sent there by the early um, uh, National Weather Bureau, a lot of it does have to do with climate. And there's lots of descriptions of snow and sun. I got so many letters from people saying, how many years did you live in Alaska? You know, you never heard it described this way. You know, and I just thinking, okay, well. <laughs> so this time, I didn't even consider it. <laughs> I, you know, I just thought, you know, I'm writing a novel. If I were writing, I'm working on a biography right now and uh, of Joan of Arc, and I will be in France in June, and I will walk every, you know, I will go everywhere Joan went in her short life and uh, take copious notes for a biography. But a novel isn't history, and human perception is so subjective. You know, two people can spend, you know, March 2nd, 1982 in Paris, and one will look back and say, oh, the most glorious day of my life, you know, blah, 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 and the other person will say, I hated it there, it was dang and dark, it rained all the time. But, but just to follow up briefly, so did you immerse yourself in books about the period? Yeah. Did you meet any Russian immigrants or, or anything like that? I'm just wondering. Um, I know a couple of Russian immigrants, but I didn't really extract information from them. There's a huge wealth of material on the Russian Revolution, thousands of books. And the Romanovs have, and Rasputin have been objects of fascination for many years. So there's a lot out there. Uh, and I did a lot of homework. And I, my tendency, generally speaking, is to do research until I hit some sort of level of saturation. And I just think, OK, I can do it now. It's a sort of sense of comfort in that world, understanding it well enough that I feel like I can make up things that, that are believable. One example is the uh, poison, which is set during the Inquisition in Spain, I have a long scene that unfolds in underground prison, or prisons underground in Madrid, and they're very, yeah, um, 
and you know, detailed descriptions. I got letters from people saying, I went to Madrid and I tried to go to <laughs> into the underground prisons and nobody said there was any, sort of accusing me. <laughs> I would write back and say, well, no, actually, there aren't. <laughs> I made it up, it's a novel. <laughs> so, we have time for one more. Okay. I wanted to know, um, as a writer, mm -hmm. how do you um, manage? Does all you go know, in historical material? Does it overwhelm you, or do you you just find your way through it through the point of view of character and then accept the sacrifice of a lot of it? Is it a difficult process, or I think um, I think when histor historical novels do require a shocking amount of research. And generally speaking, I'd say that among the facts that I collect, I use perhaps 5%, which seems like not very much. But if you know historical fiction, the books that fail are the ones in which the writer cannot stick with a 5%. You know, I read a book that was set play, that took place in New York around the turn of the last century and you know we get the Otis elevator and wow we find everything out about that elevator <laughs> before we get off <laughs> you know that sort of thing so uh, I think that's the big thing to get over um, overwhelmed it can be that I'm overwhelmed but at this point having done it before I have a sort of a better sense certainly with the first book I was just I was thinking, you know, that's what's wrong with me. This is making everything so much harder. And of course, my husband was saying, I was like, this is nuts. <laughs> no, this took place 300 years ago in Spain. You don't speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and it did seem nuts. I and mean, I spent a lot of anxious time wringing my hands. But uh, now, once I have the narrator, I have a sense of what I'm looking for. So I can, once I have the history, down, you know, enough that you can give me a test on the Russian Revolution, I'll probably do pretty well. Uh, I know I know what I'm looking for. I know the details that I want to pull out. And so, overwhelming sometimes in terms of what I can fit into my rather small study, but not <laughs> in terms of the work of getting what I need. Oh, thank you. Thank you.